Americans get their news from our first guest than any other source. That's what his promo says. The good news about Peter Jennings is he is as charming and sophisticated in person as he appears on your television set each evening. The bad news is that at age 53, he has already reached the pinnacle of his career. Oh, what to do for an encore. Gentlemen, start your engines. The U.S. is trying to... I'm not sure I agree with the initial premise. You mean political qualifications as much as military? It's mid-afternoon in New York, and the final countdown is on to World News Tonight. Jennings takes part in a telephone conference with producers in bureaus across the world. Then he pours over, dissects every phrase of copy he'll read that evening, and every news script, which comes in from correspondents in the field. The 26-year veteran of ABC News was groomed by his father, a well-known Canadian broadcaster. Peter has been in training for this job since age 10. Even now, a Canadian citizen, Jennings came south for his first job with ABC as a correspondent in the mid-60s, working in New Orleans, Birmingham, and Atlanta. Peter Jennings with the news, a 30-minute summary of the day's events, brought to you Monday through Friday in color. Good evening. Conrad Adenauer is dead. He became the network's man, youngest news anchor at the tender age of 26. Those three years proved he needed more life experience before he could be the authority on it. And so he chose to hit the road as an international correspondent, reporting from the Middle East and beyond, then anchoring from London. He returned to take over the main anchor desk in 1983 from the late Frank Reynolds. Good evening. We begin tonight with something that so many... Now Jennings is at the top of his field, consistently scoring highest in the ratings and in the polls that call him everything from best dress to the guy you'd most like to trade places with. But don't count on that. Jennings isn't planning to trade this life with anyone, despite his hectic, demanding workload. Three, two... Good evening. President Bush said today that he has a plan to revolutionize... It never stops this job. I was about to go off this morning and somebody called from Washington and said an attack on Iraq is imminent. I walked in from breakfast with the Iranian foreign minister this morning and somebody said, excuse me, there's a guy on the phone from Baghdad. And it's a job that really requires more thinking time than the industry allows it. When I look at you, the Peter Jennings I see on the air, and then the Peter Jennings who's off the air, there are two different personalities there. You seem to be much more relaxed, much more lively. Is that on purpose? I mean, I'm boring on television and lively off. I would never use the word boring. You did. In that particular role, I'm only a sort of a purveyor of information. I think it's not important what pe for, for people to believe what I think. It's much more important what they think. So I tend to be rather standoffish. Um, hang back a little in terms of that. Off the air, I'm fully entitled to be the lunatic that I've <laughs> been for most of my life. Yeah. Lunatic. That is not a word I would use to describe you. Well, I'm very emotional. I mean, uh, my wife will tell you that, that uh, she's quite, and so a lot of my friends are quite surprised how under pressure on the air um, I don't get as crazed as I do sometimes off the air. What crazes you? Oh, everything. Injustice, for one thing. I mean, injustice, excitement, people. I mean, I come back from, I come back from meetings, I come back from encounters, I come back from lunches, I come back from experiences, and I, so everybody in the office says, oh, God, here he goes again, you see, because I insist on telling everybody how fabulous it was and how exciting it was and, and, and what I'd learned. I mean, learning, just, 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 for me, it's like a, it's, it's, it's some sort of an intellectual drug. Once in your life, learning was not important to you. You didn't finish high school you just didn't feel it was necessary at the time that in some ways you even lied about it that you had thought in some ways I lied about it directly you lied about it directly for 20 years are you embarrassed by that still uh, I'm a little embarrassed now I mean I, I probably was secretly embarrassed then I mean it, it was I think for a long time I thought it was such a stain on 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 me I didn't, I didn't enjoy that very much so I didn't tell the truth about it I am now much more conscious of education and make a point of trying to say to young people God forbid you should use me as an example of the way to go. When I mentioned that I was going to interview you, I had more swooning women on my hand than I thought I, had I their needed. Numbers, please. <laughs> but no, quite literally, people see you as being very urbane, very good looking, well built, well dressed, the voice. Uh, you've even been called the James Bond of broadcasting. Actually, that was, I was much younger then. Oh, uh, but you still are. No, I'm not young at all now. I'm 53 years old, for goodness sakes. And, uh, and, uh, you know, by the time James Bond was 53, I think three or four guys had played him. 
I don't know what to say about that. I, I mean, I hear it from time to time, usually from people like you. Um, and you're embarrassed by well, it. Well, I'm a little embarrassed because I don't know what to say. I mean, I think it's a fact of American life that anyone who appears on television as regularly as I appear on television and are seen... You know, somebody told me the other day that, ABC, that 100 million Americans, 100 million Americans, 100 and some odd million Americans, see something that ABC News does at least once every week. So I recognize, without being falsely humble about it, that I'm now, quote, a public figure. And a sex symbol. No, no, I think that's kind of silly. I think that's kind of silly. I mean, how can you tell a sex symbol? You only see me from the waist up to start with. <laughs> Every night I look like a box half the time. Um, people send me ties. People send me... There's a wonderful woman in Atlanta whose name I won't, I, I won't mention could be embarrassing to her, who sends me books and sometimes records. So I'm aware that there is a, a not purely journalistic relationship between people like us and, and the audience. Were you real embarrassed by Sheena Easton sending you? No, I was actually kind of envious. You liked no, it? <laughs> I like that. I was in a taxi yesterday and some guy was reading some rag and he said, he said, this is nothing, he said, compared to you and Sheena Easton. Did she really send you new photos and said she wanted to have your child? Well, is she that did. True? Well, it doesn't, she didn't. She did say in public, on television that she wanted to have my child. I think she must have known I had a Scottish grandmother, you know. I thought she was a bit impressed by that. But uh, I don't know. You see, it's more of a lineage, I think, than anything else she was impressed with. I love She's her. a lovely woman, you know. I love this accent, but how do you diminish your accent, your Canadian accent? Because you've done it over the years. Well, I don't think I have, you see. I mean, I, I, I was, when I first came back from overseas, I had to go to West Virginia to do a piece on, on, a, on the textile workers who were trying to unionize a Haynes plant. And I was met there by the local lady from, from the union plant, and, and her name was Mary Jennings. And I said, boy, am I glad to meet you, because you're the one with the accent. And uh, I don't think I've ever lost it. I mean, Canadians say outhouse, uh, still use them in many cases. Um, and they've always said that. I don't think you can change that. This is the woman Jennings has shared his life with for the past 13 years, Hungarian Kati Martin. A TV journalist, when they met, Kati now writes books and her newest offering hit the New York Times bestsellers list. Like you, I too am on my third marriage. Why is this going to work? Why do you think Katty is what you really need? Oh, I think practice makes perfect in almost anything. Do you think there's a commitment now that wasn't there before? Well, I must say that the, the, the first two women to whom I was married, one, I was terribly young, and I, I enjoy them both as human beings. I'm not sure. I know, I know at least one of them enjoys me as a human being. I think they both think reasonably well of me as human beings. I just don't think we were destined to be married and raised families. And I think it was... I think, I think for me I got to that point in life where it was time to have children. And I'm very fortunate in that, in that my wife came along at the right time and had the same attitude about children. And we are now, like all middle-aged parents, slaves to our children. Have you been through your midlife crisis yet? Not yet. I don't think, I don't think, I hope you'll tell me when it happens because I may not rec recognize it. I'm very lucky. See, I have young kids. My daughter, as I said, is 11, practicing to be 18. I have a nine-year-old son who, who thinks that my lineage is important and wants to play hockey. They're good kids. They haven't been corrupted by, by being children of someone in the public eye. I phoned my son recently and said there was a piece on, there was a piece on the broadcast tonight I think you should watch. He said, what channel, Dad? Do you limit the amount of television they can see? Oh, absolutely. And absolutely. why do you feel that's necessary? Well, because there's a lot more to do than television. I've seen these studies which say that kids can do their, modern kids can do their, tele their homework and watch MTV together. I think it's a crock. Um, but there's a lot else for them to do, and they both go to very tough schools, so they come home laden with homework. So they're allowed an hour a day, one hour a day, that's all. And, they, you know, they don't seem to be crippled yet. I mean, they seem to be getting <laughs> along just fine with books and conversation. I know your mother died recently. She did. And what do you think she was the proudest of, the fact that you were such a success in television or the fact that you finally married happily and you have two children? Well, I think, ironically, I think she was very happy with the first. I think she was very happy with the fact that I'd become a successful journalist and I hadn't completely lost it. I hope I haven't lost it and it sort of, you know, changed my life. I, my mother was a worrier. 
So everywhere I went in the world, and I lived in the Middle East for a long time, which was made any mother worry at the time I lived there, and I would call her from almost anywhere I were in the world and say, I know, Mother, you're lying awake at night, and I know you're just lying there desperately trying to find something to worry about, so let me give you something. We'd have these wonderful conversations from all over the world. What good advice did your dad give you about the business? The absolutely best advice he gave me was there is no such thing as absolute objectivity because everybody brings with them cultural, political, age, geographical, economic baggage. You and I are different in so many ways, it's some of it, only some of it's obvious. But he said you can always be fair. You have been accused by some Israelis and also by Jews in the United States of being very pro-Arab. Where do you stand? What's the sub? What's the question? The question is, are you pro-Arab? Oh, I mean, do I like Arabs? No. Do you have one viewpoint that is more Arab than protecting or relating to Israel? No. Are no. you anti-Semitic? Well, no, I'm not anti-Semitic, and that's easy to deal with. But I think what happens on any subject which is as controversial as the Middle East, and as where there are so many particular points of view, that if you, the, let's say the broadcaster or the journalist, do not hold the point of view of the person who is listening to you, you are often seen to be on the other side of the fence. I lived in the Middle East for seven years. I'm totally convinced there is no absolute truth that the Israelis are not by any means 100% right, and the Arabs are not by any means 100% right. What's the most embarrassing thing that's happened to you in your career? I once broke down on the air, which very much embarrassed me. Having told you already that I, that I don't believe in expending emotion, my own personal emotion, at least on television. During, uh, we had a, I had a colleague at ABC named Charlie Glass, who was a held hostage in the Middle East. Um, and I was on the air live on another story, and some videotape showed up of him confessing to being a CIA agent, which he wasn't. I mean, I could, I could at least imagine, and he subsequently confirmed there was a gun just out of camera range and he was a very close friend of mine I was best man at his wedding and I hadn't had a chance to see the video before it went on the air and so it went on cold and I almost some people would say more than almost I almost lost it and that was I think very embarrassing to me you're described by some of your colleagues as a perfectionist mm -hmm. and tough. and that you really are very tough on yourself I'm tough on them too <laughs> why um, well because I think listen I make a lot of money make more money than my father. I made more money than my father when I was 20 years old. And my father was a very influential, distinguished man of letters. Um, so I make a lot of money. Um, I live better than I ever imagined I was ever going to live. I have access to people in all walks of life. I've worked for ABC for 26 years. They've flown me all over the world on their ticket. I am one of the absolutely most privileged people that you can imagine. In return for that, the least bloody thing I can do is get it right and work hard. Now this is a work ethic I don't remember seeing early in your life. No, no, I know it. It's a stunning. I did no work until I was 19. I just, absolutely no 